I'm terrible at remembering to do that. So uh, here is a little bit about me. Uh, I am a web analyst on the IT communications team at McGill. Uh, I'm actually switching over though. Uh, I'm going to be going into uh, communications um, and external relations at McGill uh, starting at the beginning of July. Throughout my career, I've kind of flip-flopped back and forth between the two departments. McGill is the fourth university that I've worked at. Uh, prior to working at McGill, I worked at the University of Victoria, where I also did uh, UX uh, exercises and UX research. Um, uh, before that, I worked at Western, and uh, prior to that, at uh, King's University College. There is a link to the presentation slides right here. Uh, uh, you will be able to um, see this at the end of the presentation as well. Uh, if there's any Drupal developers in this room, we use the Shirley module to create uh, this tool so that we're able to shorten links um, for people in our community and not use Bitly or Owly, which our security inf information security people were telling us that was a security issue. Uh, so now we have our own link shortener. So if you attended my last presentation, this slide is going to look very familiar to you. Uh, I thought I would uh, start uh, this presentation in a similar manner, uh, but not from a technical perspective, but to talk about the difference between how we used to create websites and how we create websites now. In 1997, that was about the time that I started working with websites. This is a very indicative, I think, even though it looks funny. Uh, it's indicative of how websites looked back then. Um, and I don't know if there's anyone in the room that was creating websites back then, but the process of planning and, and uh, creating the architecture was pretty simple. You sat down at a desk and you created a flow chart with circles and lines that showed what your navigation structure was going to look like. And it wasn't really a, a, any democratic process. It was something usually one person did because it happened that the job happened to land in their lap and they just uh, sketched out their information structure without getting any input, really, which is a terrible way to do things. Um, for me, about 2004, uh, I realized that there was a shift. We were paying more attention to what users, uh, what user needs were. And at this point, I, I went back to school that the university I was working at the time was Western. Um, and they sent a, a lot of people, or they supported a lot of people in the department to go back and to take uh, courses in the Faculty of Information and Media Studies so that we can learn more about creating better um, information um, interfaces for our users. And then the next university I went to, which was the University of Victoria, was the first university that I started doing uh, focus group exercises and usability exercises. That was in 2008. So I think from a university perspective, that was pretty early. Um, I'm, I'm hearing a lot more now when I go to university, uh, go to conferences, about uh, other universities doing UX testing, but back then, um, it was something that was uh, a little bit kind of on the leading edge, which was kind of neat. <coughs> so right now, where we are at McGill, we're in a space where a lot of our projects uh, start with uh, UX research and uh, uh, are really based on following principles related to UX design. So here is an example of one of those projects. This is the first stage of our web evolution project. It was the launch of our new homepage, uh, which was launched in January of this year. There was extensive testing that was done, research and testing that was done uh, to come up with this design. Uh, so uh, the prior version of the website it was really one of those experiences where there were a very small pool of people that were making decisions. In this, uh, in this exercise, we did a really uh, I guess focused effort on reaching out to different departments across campus, different audience groups, and really communicating what it was we were trying to do and having different uh, experiences with them uh, where we could really kind of get down to who are we trying to promote to on our homepage and how can we best promote to them. Um, how can we best uh, interact with them or provide the information they need to see? So I'm not sure if you saw the prior version of our homepage. It was kind of a dog's breakfast. It was, I was like something for everyone was on, on that site. Uh, for this site, I was really happy because we chose just one uh, target audience, and that's prospective students and only prospective students as the audience for the homepage. And that was done after, that choice was made after extensive research. Um, in terms of uh, identifying how people are using our website, who is actually coming to our website, and what they're getting out of, of the homepage experience. Um, so 
There is background information about that. Everything that I am uh, giving information on, if, if, you're, if you have questions about it later on, feel free to come up. I'm just going to touch on it very lightly here. So I'm going to um, now get into the nitty gritty of the presentation. I, at, for this presentation, I wanted to provide something extra in terms of UX. So I, it's not a basic primer in terms of how you can do UX at your university. I was really happy because I went to go see Aiden's presentation yesterday. Um, so I wanted to mention he, his presentation covered really well a lot of the, the basic concepts um, on how you can do UX, best practices for doing UX at your university. The slides, I believe, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Aiden Foster. <coughs> Fosterinteractive.com slash UX tips. Okay, so that's where you can find the slides. So if you want background information about uh, some of these concepts, because I'm going kind of a step beyond that and I'm going to talk about how to do uh, this effectively in a team structure, um, uh, you might not uh, have uh, the background information that you need. If you have questions, that's a good place for you to go. I also have a resource slide at the end of my presentation that has some additional resources that you can look into. So benefits, uh, why we uh, do UX exercises. Um, so these are some pretty standard reasons why. I, I think uh, there's a few higher ed people here. How many people uh, conduct extra, uh, UX exercises or follow UX design principles um, in your institution? Can you show of hands? Okay, so there's a few people, but uh, of those people who maybe aren't doing it right now, is there maybe an interest in doing UX? Or I know that uh, it's, this is kind of still something that's emerging, so uh, I think uh, if there's uh, an, an interest, uh, I guess if you have an interest in finding ways to, um, I guess, in, encourage interest in UX in your, your uh, university that you work at, um, I think uh, that's a discussion that a lot of people um, that, I, that we had at the Higher Ed uh, Summit yesterday, um, and there were a lot of also suggested tools uh, for, for that. So feel free to mo approach me after that if you're interested. But these are, um, if you're not familiar with uh, uh, the benefits of uh, UX, here are some very uh, standard uh, uh, things that you can get out of, out of following these principles. So, when our participants participate in the exercises and uh, <coughs> gather research through uh, uh, UX research, we get information, better information about what our audience needs are. Uh, we also have a better understanding of uh, user, user interfaces, how well they work, what concerns there are that we need to address. Um, and we also get information about our preferences for look and feel. Uh, at uh, McGill, uh, we have some unique uh, things that are available to us, I think, because we have such an extensive team. Our development team at McGill includes uh, technical writers, trainers, uh, support staff, um, developers, and all these people are located on campus. They're not people that traditionally would be involved in uh, these uh, UX exercises or, or participating in UX exercises, but uh, we have realized through a lot of the work that we do that there is great benefit in finding ways to incorporate uh, different uh, tasks or, or different uh, roles um, in our web team in the tasks that we're doing. And we wanted to explore ways to do this with UX. So, of course, the, the way to look at, at that would be to think about how people might be able to participate in these exercises. So in terms of who, uh, for example, we get to participate in our focus groups, um, we often are looking at target audience members uh, to participate in our focus groups, and it, it depends on what project we're working on, um, who those people are. But basically, um, often they're students, faculty, staff, um, alumni, and maybe external community members uh, that may come to the website on a regular basis. But there's also other roles that we have, um, other people that are participating in these um, exercises. We have facilitators, uh, people like uh, myself, who would go in and facilitate uh, a usability test or a workshop um, or a user journey mapping exercise. Um, we have note takers. Uh, observers is another opportunity for people to participate, or project team members, just generally people that are working on these uh, projects uh, to uh, revise and revamp these websites. 
So, what are some benefits that we've realized incorporating uh, these additional roles? Um, so, uh, there's a number of things that we started to, uh, to a number of benefits that we started to experience right off the get-go uh, when we uh, incorporated uh, a broader team uh, set into our exercises. One was we were hearing more often about possible technology enhancements. So this was from having our developers uh, participate, obviously, uh, in our UX exercises. So they participated quite extensively in the user journey mapping exercises that we did. We did these exercises across campus in different departments. And one of the things that they were able to identify is that there was a real importance in making sure it was easy uh, for people to uh, create content that could be shared across websites. Um, and we have that to some extent now because we have a bunch of integration. So we have a bunch of uh, tools available to our site managers where they can easily pull in uh, course information from our e-calendar. Um, so it's dynamically updated on their sites or uh, biography information from our banner system so they don't have to keep contact information up to date. So we have a bunch of integrations like that. But one of the things that kind of is missing is this idea of just allowing people to create a content block that could be shared uh, across departments. So um, not just kind of a, a, a pool of information, but for example, admissions information that is displayed on pretty much every faculty website um, that we have. Um, so that information could potentially be managed um, and laid out by uh, the Enrollment Services Office, for example, and it could be automatically updated. So that was an idea that was proposed uh, by one of our developers. And I, I know that uh, it might seem like, oh, why didn't that occur to you before? Um, you know, from a technical pers perspective, you um, uh, aren't always aware of what the possibilities are for a developer to be involved. Um, they can present those ideas, and they also need to recognize the need to be able to get behind making that update um, in the system. So it's kind of a two-way um, to uh, uh, improve our process. Um, in terms of uh, ways to improve our web processes specifically, um, another uh, uh, improvement that we realized was uh, when we did uh, usability testing in the Faculty of Engineering, or actually uh, focus group uh, workshops in the Faculty of Engineering, we had some high-level key stakeholders participate in that. Um, I talked a little bit in my previous um, presentation about an improvement that we have in the Faculty of Engineering where we now have a committee of high-level strategic um, of people that can make authoritative decisions um, on websites. Um, so these are people not, uh, they're not site managers, they're not uh, editors, they're people that actually affect communications and strategy changes. And having that committee allows us to um, communicate our updates and the changes and the enhancements that we're making in our tool with people that can actually affect communication strategy changes. So what was happening before was we realized we would make enhancements to our tool, we would communicate them to our site managers, and then those updates would fall flat because the site managers didn't have the authority to say, hey, we need to introduce this, this change on our website that is gonna affect the way we communicate with our community. So having that in the Faculty of Engineering um, is really beneficial now. And that uh, idea for that was um, inspired by uh, people in that uh, level, of that level participating in our focus group exercises. So there are benefits, but there are also challenges. Um, so this is where uh, the section where I'm going to uh, get into the challenges. I did this uh, presentation for my partner. He calls it the story section. Uh, it's the section where I kind of get into some of the failures that we had when we tried to uh, incorporate uh, different uh, people into our, us our user experience exercises. I don't know if anyone has any ideas about what might have happened or gone wrong um, when we tried to incorporate our support staff, our developers, um, our, our key stakeholders. I don't know if anyone can guess, <laughs> but uh, I, <laughs> I, it'll be very obvious, I think, once I start talking about there were more. There were mostly issues that were related to things like bias 
um, personal bias in terms of uh, experiences that people had had, especially related to past experiences. There were difficulties with point of view. Um, so uh, it, people had difficulty putting themselves in the shoes of the, the target audience that we were actually trying to get information about. Um, and another thing was uh, if we brought people in to, to these exercises as facilitators or um, note takers or uh, other uh, roles, sometimes they had difficulty remaining objectives and, and would get pulled into conversation with our uh, test participants about the decisions that we're making. And I've actually seen um, some of these uh, members uh, actually challenge some of the input that's being made at these exercises, which is, as you know, is a, a big no-no. Um, so uh, I will uh, go through a few of those now. Uh, just to start this section, I'm going to give you uh, just an overview of the, the range of exercises. This is not a complete list, uh, but it's some of the types of exercises that we conduct at McGill. So our first <coughs> workshops, User journey mapping, surveys, tree testing, usability testing, A-B testing, um, reviewing existing data, of course. There's a bunch of other things that we do too, and we, and we don't do all of these things for every project. Um, it depends on uh, uh, the complexity of the project, if we have other existing data that can feed that project, um, and, and a bunch of other factors will help us decide what is necessary. Um, I'm not also, again, going to get into in-depth what, uh, what these uh, uh, types of exercises are, but you can refer to Aiden's presentation if you want the background information about, about uh, of what these are and how you can do them. So here's one example of a focus group exercise that we did, a brainstorming <coughs> diagram for information students. Uh, of the type of information information students look for when they arrive on the engineering homepage. Um, so this is uh, what's called an open uh, card sort. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that term. Okay, I'll, I'll just, uh, for those who might not uh, be familiar, it's a type of workshop where you bring in participants and you allow them to sort content um, and categorize content based under, or, or sorted under categories that they determine. Um, so we decided to do this exercise. The, the Faculty of Engineering obviously had an existing website. Um, the reason why we decided to do this, web, this exercise, which is kind of starting things at the base level, was we did an initial analysis of the website. We did um, a benchmarking analysis and looked at other engineering sites, and we realized that there we had a big jump to make in terms of how we needed to improve uh, this site. So we started by just getting people into a room and having them talk about what it is they need to see on the site um, and to organize that information in terms of importance. So in this uh, exercise, and these are pictures, all these pictures that I'm showing by the way are examples of the actual exercises that I'm talking about. They're photos taken from the exercise. Um, we got a lot of, of great participation, there was engagement, um, we got uh, some really good input, everyone was really excited, which is really great to see when you have, um, when you conduct these types of exercises. But uh, we also had uh, one of the key stakeholders um, participate in this, and we got some good ideas from that key stakeholder. Um, but after the presentation, or after the experience wrapped up, um, a comment was he made a comment about the fact that a lot of the input that he had provided was actually related to um, a, a site that didn't exist anymore and conversations that he had had in the past. Um, and it, it wasn't relevant to actually what the experience was of students at this time. And unfortunately at that time all that information that he had provided was already mixed in with the data that we had collected. Um, so this is a, a difficulty that uh, when you work in a university environment, um, there's a lot of staff members who have uh, been at the university for a long time and they're prone to bringing in this kind of historical kind of point of view. Um, so it's something that uh, we found we had to watch out for. Um, the solution that we came up with to this is we are now doing a better job of communicating goals and perspective or goals and um, objectives, especially to people that are participating outside the audience group. The audience group is obviously going to stay focused on on the information we're trying to gather, but other people we bring into the discussion, we're really trying to, to do a better job of making sure they're aware of, of who it is, the perspective that we're looking at. 
Here is another example of an exercise that we did. Uh, this was related to a service. I don't know if, uh, I, I find in the types of um, UX testing that we do, one of the most difficult uh, departments, types of departments to test for are service departments, because they often have a crazy amount of labels uh, or services or um, uh, information to organize and they're using a lot of terminology that's really internal or it's terminology that's kind of technical um, so it's a little bit of a difficult uh, a, a more difficult uh, type of, of uh, I guess audience uh, testing to really get right uh, so we do usually extensive testing and this is one of those we were trying to create a, a service a category label structure for a service catalog for IT services. There were 150 services that needed to be sorted and categorized. I've never done a card sort this big. Um, so we did it as a closed uh, card sort in, um, in uh, contrast to the open card sort. In a closed card sort, you actually provide the categories. You don't ask people uh, to make up the categories. And as you can understand, it would have been really overwhelming if we'd asked them to do that. So we did give them the opportunity uh, to uh, create other labels if they felt that that was necessary. So here is what that looked like. I was a little bit concerned when we started the exercise that they would find it overwhelming, but they really dug in there um, and they made it happen and it was really great. We actually did it in two sections. So the first series of workshops we held, we, got, uh, we focused really on choosing the category labels. So uh, we just got them to tell us uh, we, we had done a bunch of, of uh, research and looked into a good, uh, a good set of labels that we could um, test for every category and we got them to sort those labels best based on what worked best. Um, so once we had the categories chosen, we then, with a separate group of people, um, showed them the categories, gave them the 150 services, and asked them to sort those 150 services under the categories that had been chosen um, in the previous um, exercise. So uh, we got a, a lot of great data out of this. We were really lucky with this project because we had a big, long timeline, so there was lots of opportunity to uh, experiment with different prototypes, that we could test and do extensive um, workshops like this, and we got some good information out of it. But uh, we had some difficulties. Again, we were involving our uh, team members in this um, exercise, and this one in particular, we had difficulty. Uh, when I went back to some of the notes that were taken, we had support staff members that were participating in this, um, and some of the, the note takers had focused on collecting information not about the navigation structure but about the IT service itself. So I had some um, pages of notes about what people thought about their email going down frequently or about how long it took them for their tickets to get answered online rather than information that was specifically related to what we were trying um, to uh, test. So that uh, told us that what we needed to do was to provide better structure in terms of, um, and guidance, and sometimes training um, in terms of what we're looking for from note takers and facilitators in these exercises and the actual information that they need to gather. And we didn't want to stop people from collecting you know, related information because it's useful. It's useful for, for the departments to know these things, but to keep that information, those notes separate from the information they're gathering um, for our UX exercise. So uh, this is another exercise that we did. This is a user journey mapping. Um, this is uh, I relate. I talked about this earlier. It's part of the homepage uh, redesign that we did. We did uh, testing at both of our campuses. We talked to a lot of audience members, um, but uh, and we we did it in a number of different departments. One of the problems that we had with this project was. Uh, because we were doing so many series of uh, so many workshops in so many different departments, it wasn't always possible to get the students, our target audience, um, involved um, in doing these exercises. Uh, so I, I know that uh, the, the, the people that did participate, so we got staff members and key stakeholders, they were able to provide useful information. Um, but again, sometimes it's not a current or relevant, or sometimes it's, it's tainted by, by past experience. 
Um, and also the optics. I think one of the uh, feedback that we get from students often is the sense of, uh, you know, these websites aren't working for me because you don't ask me um, about what I need to see on them. Um, so it's really important for us to really try it and get students to participate in these exercises, not just because they provide valuable feedback, but also because it, it, it gives them the, um, I guess, the memory um, when they come up to, uh, you know, these these kinds of, of messages that they hear, someone is able to say, well, yes, uh, you know, I am a student and I was asked and I did get to participate in these exercises. Um, so as you can imagine, if you, if you do testing with students, uh, we had difficulty recruiting students during exam periods and around the holidays, just exactly what you would expect. Um, and what we did in those cases is we uh, had scripts, we worked from scripts. Um, that were uh, the um, uh, that were transcripts of interviews that had happened with, with students. So we were able to interview students at times when it was um, you know uh, easy for them to provide information to us, often in the evening or on the weekends. And then we took those scripts back to our exercises, and we had people participate, but to draw their input from those scripts so that they were really providing input that was uh, relevant to the current student experience. So, this is the last one I'm gonna get into. I was uh, joking with Ava about this. This is Optimal Workshop. Uh, it is an example of a tree test, uh, and it's a tree test report. I love this tool, um, and I don't know what, last year I went to a bunch of conferences. Just about every conference I went to, there were three or four presentations that had Optimal Workshop tree deck. Um, reports uh, in, uh, in one of the slides. So this is the output of that big um, exercise with, where we were trying to get them to sort all of those services. Uh, so after we uh, did those workshops, we created two prototypes, um, and we wanted to see which, which navigation pro prototype was going to work best. So we tree tested them both. Um, if you're not familiar with Optimal Workshop, um, I'll, I'll show you uh, kind of how it works. From a, um, so uh, this first, uh, this, it's a usability test to start. So this is the question we asked. Uh, where would you click to find information on how to set up your McGill email on your computer? And this uh, graphic that we have here is a, a visual uh, display of the navigation path that people took. Uh, so everybody started here on the service catalog homepage. The lines that are going out from that uh, first pie chart show the different directions that people went in. Green means they went in a good direction. Red means they went in, they, they couldn't find what they were looking for. It, it was a bad uh, decision. Blue means they had to go back, so they got, co uh, they got cold and they went back in the navigation structure. We coupled uh, this uh, reporting with uh, notes that we took in Reframer. Um, and uh, Reframer is another tool that's available in Optimal Workshop. Um, and we've been experimenting with ways to uh, uh, tag uh, uh, the feedback that we're getting during our uh, tree testing and during our usability testing so we can easily go back to these red circles and find out exactly what was happening at that spot that people were confused or they didn't know where to go or um, whatever happened that there was a breakdown in the navigation structure. Um, so that's how we were able to identify what the actual issues were and we were able to better refine the navigation. Um, again, here there, there was a little bit of a difficulty. Uh, so uh, when we initially tried to do the tree testing, um, and this is uh, something that is sometimes suggested, uh, we, we thought let's test our, our usability test internally uh, to see uh, you know, what the internal feedback is going to be. So we brought uh, the test over to uh, the other side of our um, IT department floor, and uh, we tested it with a couple of the network people. And uh, they had difficulty actually navigating the structure. It, it actually worried us. And it became very obvious very quickly that the problem that they were having was they were looking at it from the perspective of someone who is internal to our department. We use very different language um, in the way that we label uh, our services. And we have a, I mean, an internal uh, kind of uh, structure of the way our teams are organized that they were expecting to see 
um, mirrored in its navigation structure and it wasn't there. Um, so uh, we realized from that that uh, it's not always possible um, to uh, incorporate people as test uh, participants in, in these exercises, um, but you know, that isn't always the case. Sometimes it is, it just in this case wasn't. Um, so it's a, uh, I guess uh, the, the best practice takeaway that we had was just to be uh, aware that you you have to continually refine and kind of tailor your practices based on uh, the different uh, restrictions of the project. So uh, I'm gonna just quickly show you a few of these solutions that I've talked about uh, when I've gone through uh, some of the challenges that we've experienced. Uh, for example, uh, one of them, I, I, we spoke about this a little bit in the higher ed uh, summit yesterday, if anybody went there, the idea of having a clearly defined plan. Um, so we had assumed, uh, uh, I think that having the actual project plan, having a plan about uh, just uh, how the uh, web project was going to go would be enough. We realized that we had to also have a plan in place for our participants, our facilitators, our note takers, to let them know how this project was going to go from their perspective. Um, so to clearly define what the goals and objectives were, the exercises we were doing, uh, the timeline and responsibility, so when they were going to be able to you know, participate and provide feedback, participate in our analysis, um, and provide structure for that team analysis, um, so that they're not uh, providing feedback uh, as the workshop is going on, but they are giving their analysis in meetings afterwards um, when we were actually focusing on the analysis. Uh, another um, thing uh, that we, uh, or another set of things that we uh, develop for our participants, we give them uh, how-to documentation, we provide information in training sessions if needed, we have um, more advanced uh, templates and guidelines that we make available, and this idea of transcripts um, from uh, interviews with audience members. So it's just basically uh, making sure that uh, uh, I think before, when we started to incorporate other team members in, in these exercises, we just assumed that they would know, um, you know what the goals were and, and, and the information we needed to collect and how to collect it, um, just by giving them kind of a basic overview of, of what was happening. But we realized it actually sometimes needs a very detailed um, explanation. So here's a slide um, from one of the exercises that we did where we were involving people that don't normally do UX testing. Um, so we uh, did a presentation specifically about uh, the exercise we were doing. We explained the mechanics of what it was we were trying to construct. Um, we talked about how we construct it and, and why we followed that process to construct it. And then we talked about how we're going to use that tool afterwards um, to create a, a design for our website. So this wasn't necessary for every project. This was related to the redesign of the homepage. So um, as you can imagine, all those uh, workshops that we did, there was some very high level strategic people involved. This uh, type of uh, detail was necessary. It's not always necessary, um, it, but sometimes it is. Here's another example. This is a, a, just a set of guidelines that we presented for note takers. It's related to that uh, discussion that, uh, or that uh, piece that I mentioned earlier about the difficulty we had with staff members that were recording kind of tangential information. Um, so we just realized that it was important to actually outline exactly what it was we were trying to get feedback on. We couldn't just assume that people would understand um, that we were here to test the navigation, so we're looking for navigation feedback. So in summary, uh, I just wanted to uh, say again uh, that there are a lot of benefits. Uh, there, there are the, the regular benefits that you always get out of doing, um, uh, following UX uh, design practices and doing UX research. So you get uh, a better understanding of user needs, you get a more improved interface, and uh, you have a better understanding of user preferences for look and feel. But on top of that, if you're willing to uh, incorporate other people um, into these exercises, developers, um, trainers, uh, key stakeholders, you will get an additional level of um, benefit out of that experience. Um, we're very lucky um, at McGill because we have, uh, at other universities we've worked at, um, the, the team that provides um, our development and our training and our documentation maybe 
wasn't um, present on campus at McGill it is, so it makes it easier for us to incorporate. But um, you know, I'd love to hear in the future maybe um, about a situation where uh, you know these types of of um, I guess experiences were made possible uh, where these teams are located off campus. Uh, so uh, just in a wrap up too, I wanted to mention this last point. I think another kind of side benefit of this is just a better relationship between our, our developers and our training staff with uh, our audience uh, members, both because they see them at the exercises and because uh, there's a, a way better understanding um, on a more in-depth level of what our user needs are. So I'm going to show these pictures again. I'm wrapping up now. Um, I'm going to show some of the people that are uh, in these pictures that are uh, not uh, our audience members. So this person here in the blue shirt, uh, that is one of our support team members. Um, in that picture there in the top right, in the top right of the uh, photo, you'll see some of our development team there. Uh, they're there as developers. Um, here in the uh, far right again, you see um, one of our project team members. And in this picture here, uh, the woman seated, that's one of our trainers um, who's taking notes. So here are the additional resources I said I would share. Um, it, uh, Aiden also had some really good resources in his. Uh, you mentioned the um, uh, rocket science book. Rocket surgery. Rocket surgery book. Um, this is um, Steve Krug's other book, Don't Make Me Think. It's an earlier um, UX uh, or usability testing, um, uh, I guess, home. So uh, it's, it was where I first started, and it's the thing that it really inspired me, but um, rocket, the rocket surgery. Rocket book. surgery made easy is basically the, in, the user testing, like the act of how to do user tests and try not to bias yourself and mm -hmm. so on, and then don't make me think is sort of the primer for that. The mechanics. The, the, yeah, yeah, so both are awesome. Yes, I agree. So, uh, so that is that. I One other thing to wrap up, we are hiring right now. We're looking for a developer for our team. Uh, if you are interested in applying or if you know someone that might be interested in doing development uh, in a university environment, I we would love to, uh, if you would pass on this information to us. The job is posted on our HR website, our McGill HR website. You can take a look. And that is it. So I have a little bit of time for questions. <coughs> I don't know if anyone has any questions. Yes? Do, do you have, so you mentioned you have a UX how-to toolkit that you, uh, I guess, distribute internally for workshopping, I guess, to spread the knowledge uh, wider. Is that available publicly, or is that a private thing? It's, it, not. it's not available publicly, and it's not available publicly because we tailor it to the department that we're working on, because it's not the same process that we follow. So we didn't want to really make it available online because we don't want people to refer to something that's specifically for a project yeah. um, that might not be relevant to their project. But it would be similar to the, the example you had before with uh, these are the exact questions you should be trying to get the answers to and those kinds of things. Exactly, yeah. And it, it incorporates some of the other, like the, the slide with the uh, questions. Yeah. That's another um, a thing that we might include in there. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, basically it's an overview of the mechanics of, of how the exercise is going to happen, the, the whys and, and what's going to happen next. Um, with, along with some kind of background information about, as a participant, where where are you going to participate and what input are you going to give? So it's focused on, on the people that are going to take part. Cool. Anybody else? Yes? So how is your team structured? Is it like a full-time UX specialist or is it like a web developer or a content specialist and part of their job is UX. How do you, how is it structured at your end at the university? There is no dedicated UX person right now okay. um, at the university. We have this web evolution project in place. Actually, that's not accurate. There's no UX person um, at, at the university in a centrally supported department. Okay. There is a UX position in the library department. I think library is one of those departments where it they warrant having an ongoing person to continually do uh, UX. Um, we are, have um, people on our team that have expertise and background um, in terms of doing UX, but uh, the way our team is structured, uh, 
we uh, share our work. Um, so it's a development team. So uh, we all kind of do UX exercises. We all do usability testing. Um, part of that web evolution project that's happening though, we're uh, doing a better job. We're going to be doing a better job, I think, of defining the difference between the people that create and manage content and provide content resources at the university. Those people are in communication services versus the development team, which is um, uh, the team that works more on creating the tool um, that we work with. So I, there should be a more defined sense of, of who is going to be um, uh, providing that resource, and it should be seen. I'm actually about to move into that department. Okay. Um, so I'll start a role there at the beginning of July. So I will see that uh, come together. <laughs> Anybody else? Can I ask a little bit about the sort of the, the structure that these the, the UX tests like is it a like a faculty that comes to you and says we need a website mm -hmm. is that and do you guys provide the whole website or you do the UX testing and then that gets handed off to an external vendor so we work as closely with the department as possible to make it possible for them to do these things themselves um, so in some cases a, a lot of cases uh, People in the department don't have time and they don't have the expertise um, to be able to take on uh, redesign projects. In those cases, if it's a very strategic project, we might come in and provide um, support. Um, but we try to make it possible for site managers, our site managers, to at least participate in, if not facilitate, these exercises themselves. Um, because we realize that if we do that, um, they will be able to, on an ongoing basis, uh, continue to do UX testing as needed and continue to evaluate the site, which is necessary. We can continue to provide in-depth support to them on an ongoing basis indefinitely. So it's, it's great for us to be able to empower them to, uh, to do it themselves. Um, but it's not always possible. And then um, at that point, uh, sometimes it's necessary to turn it over to an external vendor um, or uh, to help the department hire new staff um, to help see them through the project, maybe temporarily. So there's a bunch of different solutions that you can look at. So, yes? Um, so I have a question about uh, your user research. So not, this, not so much the usability testing, but the research phase at the beginning. How did you go about recruiting um, people in your audience for that? Hmm. Uh, yeah, there was a, there's some great tips that we've come across. One of them was shared in the Higher Ed uh, Summit yesterday. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, somebody asked, how do we recruit students? Um, and it, that is something that's always difficult. Uh, but uh, we tried a bunch of different incentives uh, to get students to participate, uh, you know, gift certificates, uh, gifts, and things like that. The thing that inevitably works the best is chocolate bars in the library. They have to be full-size chocolate bars, um, and if you sit in the library, <laughs> yeah, you, can't, you can't have the little like Halloween chocolate bars, that doesn't work. They have to be like O. Henry, Kit Kat, like the full chocolate bar, and then they will approach the desk. And I've had experiences where you, you can't just have one person doing testing, you have to have multiple people, because you have, um, at times, I've been inundated by students um, who come up and say, how can I get a candy? Um, and if you say, uh, you just have to sit down and do this test, then it's really easy to recruit um, students. It's a little bit more difficult for the uh, workshops uh, because you're actually trying to get uh, students into a space. Sometimes pizza, homework, um, food is often, it's, it's interesting how it's food oriented, but it totally makes sense. I, especially in the library, they're hungry, they're studying, but if you actually do it during exam period, it's great because there's students that are looking for a little bit of a break, and if they don't uh, participate right away, they'll come back to you when they're ready to have a little break. Um, but yeah, uh, pizza sometimes works uh, for those workshops, but really for uh, trying to get them into the workshops, one of the, the key things is just not to schedule it during exam period or close to the holidays, to do it at a time when it really works well. The time of year that we find works best is the very start of the semester. And I don't know why, but we get a really good turnout. You'd think that they would be really busy with a whole bunch of things, but I think at that time they're still really fresh you know, they, they have time in their calendar because their courses haven't really ramped up yet, and they can um, devote time to these types of exercises. So something to consider. Yes? Um, how do you recruit prospective students, or how do you do research for them? As you mentioned uh, that the redesign for the Mikkel homepage is focusing 
really on, on the prospective students? Mm -hmm. So how do you learn about that because you won't find them? Absolutely. So uh, there's two ways. One, we look at uh, new students at the beginning of the school year because they have recently been through uh, the registration, the, the, the application process, and the acceptance process. Um, and the other way is we uh, 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 collaborate or connect with um, uh, guidance counselors in stage apps and uh, high schools to set up uh, testing sessions in high schools and um, uh, uh, stage apps. So uh, there's there's a bunch of different. Um, I've had a bunch of different experiences with that. Usually, though, the the people that we connect with are really great at identifying students who are going to be keen and really good to participate um, in the exercise. And we've gotten really good, uh, uh, I guess, input out of that. So that's what we did for the homepage. Um, we went into a, I think it was Dawson. Um, we went into a couple of, uh, of university or different high schools that feed into McGill um, specifically and did testing with them. Anyone else? Just um, uh, for your card sorting exercises, so you mentioned open and closed, so that's predefined categories or not. Um, have you ever tried or experimented with, because again, you have to get everyone in the room. And that's good. That's good energy, but the, as well. But I know there's tools that are like online mm -hmm. card sorting tools. Mm -hmm. Have you experimented with any of those and and had positive or negative results? We did. Um, one of the negative things that, that's kind of uh, kept us from doing that more often is we uh, when we want to do those types of exercises, we usually look at doing them in our computer labs so that people can. It, it's still an in-person yeah. experience, but there's an online. Um, but we can't bring food into our computer labs, so then we can't um, entice people to participate in the exercise. Um, and we find when we send out uh, the uh, card sorting um, exercise as something people can do independently, we don't get the input and the, especially the qualitative data that we can capture if they're doing it in person. Um, so that's kind of one of the key reasons why um, we haven't uh, used it. I can't remember what is it optimal sort. I think there the is optimal, one, yeah. yeah, optimal workshop. Uh, but we we've tried it a couple of times. Um, but we've found that the, the the depth of the data that we've gotten from those experiences hasn't been um, as rich. I think as the in person. So just because the conversation that happens while sticking things to a whiteboard and, and that kind of thing? Absolutely, yeah. So the, the really good uh, feedback that we get is in listening to people, especially when they have conversations where there's conflict. One person is saying, um, you know, it should be this. The other person is saying it should be this. And then they provide a lot of detail about why. And that uh, is something that we don't get if they're, they're not going to provide that feedback if, if they're just uh, doing the experience online. Yes, really good questions. I think that's it. We're out of time, so I think it's time for lunch. Um, so thanks, everyone, for coming out.